This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 39, Orthonormal Sets. Our objectives for this lecture are to determine whether a given set of vectors is an orthonormal set, compute the coordinates of a vector relative to an orthonormal basis, and find the inverse of an orthogonal matrix. First, let's recall some of the definitions from the previous two lectures. We said that two vectors u and v are orthogonal if u dot v is equal to zero, and a set of non-zero vectors u1 through up and rn is an orthogonal set if each distinct pair of vectors is orthogonal. That is, ui dot uj is equal to zero whenever i and j are different subscripts. And we also talked about unit vectors, and a unit vector is a vector whose length is one, so that's the length of v, which is the square root of v dot v, which is equal to one. And note here that because the square root of 1 is 1, this just means that v dot v is equal to 1. Now in this lecture, we're going to be talking about orthonormal sets. An orthonormal set is a set of vectors u1 through up, where ui dot ui is 1, and ui dot uj is 0 whenever i is not equal to j. So in other words, an orthonormal set is an orthogonal set, where every vector is also a unit vector. So for example, if we have these three vectors, v1, v2, and v3, we want to show that this is an orthonormal set. First, we need to show that the set v1, v2, and v3 is orthogonal. So that means that we need to show that vi dot vj is 0 whenever i is not equal to j. Those are the highlighted dot products that you see here. And then we need to show that every vector in this set is a unit vector, which means that we need to show that vi dot vi is equal to 1. And those are the other dot products that you see down the diagonal of this chart here. Let's do a couple of these. So for example, v1 dot v1 is the sum of the squares of the entries of the vector v1, which is, as you can see here, equal to 1. And we can also compute v1 dot v2, which works out to be 0, as you can see here. So continuing in this way, we compute all nine dot products and show that this is an orthonormal set. Now it turns out that when we have a matrix, an m by n matrix u that has orthonormal columns, that happens if and only if u transpose times u is equal to the n by n identity matrix. Let's just illustrate the idea of this proof by using the case where u has three columns. So we'll call the columns of u u1, u2, and u3. So u transpose u, the rows of u transpose are the same as the columns of u. And remember that when we multiply a matrix by another matrix, we go across the rows of the first matrix and down the columns of the second matrix. So that's going to give us a 3 by 3 result that you can see here. Now when we have a transpose of a vector times another vector, that's the same as the dot product. So that means that our entries of this matrix u transpose u are actually the pairwise dot products of our u vectors. And so when will this equal the 3 by 3 identity matrix? Well, notice that this 3 by 3 matrix resembles our grid of dot products from the previous example. And we can see that this set of vectors is going to be orthonormal if and only if u transpose u equals the 3 by 3 identity matrix. The pink dot products being 0, it represents the idea that the set of vectors is orthogonal, and the green dot products being 1 represents the notion that every vector in this set is a unit vector. And so that proves the theorem in this case. Hopefully this 3 by 3 example helps you see the idea. Now something else that we saw in a previous lecture is that we have a nice formula for the coordinates of a vector when we have an orthogonal basis. So remember that when script B, being the set u1 through up, is an orthogonal basis for a subspace w of Rn, and y is a vector in w, then the coordinates of y in the basis b can be computed as ci equals y dot ui divided by ui dot ui for each i. Now when this is an orthonormal basis, the formula simplifies even more because the expression ui dot ui is just going to be 1, and so the formula for coordinates in an orthonormal basis is just y dot ui. So if we have a vector and we have an orthonormal basis, and we want the coordinates of that vector in that basis, all we have to do is take the dot product of our vector with each basis vector, and those will be the coordinates. Now matrices with orthonormal columns have even more nice properties. So we can see these here. So if u is an m by n matrix that has orthonormal columns, and x and y are vectors in Rn, then part a here says that the length of ux is equal to the length of x, part b says that ux dot uy is equal to x dot y, and part c says that ux dot uy is equal to 0, if and only if x dot y equals 0. Now we're going to start by proving statement b, and then show how statements a and c follow from statement b. 
And just like before, we're going to illustrate the ideas of this proof using the case where n equals 3, where we have three columns in our matrix. So we're going to write u equaling u1, u2, u3, where those are three vectors in Rn. And we'll let x and y be vectors with three entries. So remember that the part that we're trying to prove here says that ux dot uy is equal to x dot y. So ux is the linear combination of the columns of u whose weights are the x's, and uy is the linear combination of the columns of capital U whose weights are the y's. And so when we dot those two vectors together, we can use the distributive property to expand this product. So that gives us something that looks like this. But again, notice that we have all of these different pairwise dot products of the columns of u, and since the columns of u are orthonormal, form an orthonormal set, the pink highlighted dot products here are 0, and the green highlighted dot products here are 1, which means that this ux dot ui simplifies to x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus x3 times y3, and that is exactly x dot y. Why is part A of this theorem true? Well, the length of ux is the square root of ux dot ux, but we just proved that u times a vector dotted with u times a vector is equal to just the dot product of those two vectors. So ux dot ux is equal to x dot x, that's coming from part b, and the square root of x dot x is the length of x. And then for part c, since ux dot uy is equal to x dot y, clearly the left-hand side is going to equal 0 if and only if the right-hand side is going to equal 0. This theorem that we just proved shows that the transformation t of x equals ux preserves both length and orthogonality. And this is useful when we're working with computer graphics, because we will often want to think about transformations that preserve lengths, distances, angles, etc. And so we want to use matrices that have orthonormal columns because those transformations do preserve those things. Now, if u is a square matrix with orthonormal columns, then the fact that u transpose u is equal to the identity matrix implies that u transpose is u inverse. And this is especially handy because, as you remember, when we talked about the algorithm for computing the inverse of a square matrix, we have to do a lot of row reductions and calculations. But when that matrix happens to have orthonormal columns, we don't need to do any calculations. All we need to do is form the transpose. When we have a square matrix like this, we call it an orthogonal or orthonormal matrix. We really should call it an orthonormal matrix because the matrix has orthonormal columns. But unfortunately, the more common name for this kind of matrix is an orthogonal matrix. So even though an orthogonal matrix is a matrix with orthonormal columns, we don't often call it an orthonormal matrix. So going forward, you're going to hear me calling these orthogonal matrices. All right, so let's look at another example. So here we have three vectors, u1, u2, and u3. We want to show that b is an orthonormal basis for R3. So what about the word basis there? Basis means that these three vectors are linearly independent and that they span R3. And then orthonormal would mean that the vectors are pairwise orthogonal, and that each of the vectors is a unit vector. Those four things are what, quote, orthonormal basis means. And so it seems like we have a lot of work out of us. But if we can prove that the vectors are pairwise orthogonal, if we can prove number three here, then as we proved in a previous lecture, that proves that the vectors are linearly independent. Any orthogonal set of non-zero vectors must be linearly independent. And since R3 has dimension three, once we have a linearly independent set in R3 that has three vectors in it, that must automatically span R3. And so if we can prove three, then that proves one and two. So all we need to do is show that these vectors form an orthonormal set, and because that set has the right number of vectors in it, it must automatically be an orthonormal basis for R3. Now we're going to do this by putting these vectors into a matrix that we'll call capital U and computing U transpose U and making sure that we get the identity matrix. That's using a theorem that we proved earlier in this lecture. This time, though, let's use Wolfram to save some time. So here, as you can see, I've typed in the three vectors. And if I put those three vectors into a list, then that actually gives me U transpose. The way that matrices are entered into Wolfram is one row at a time. And so this matrix is the matrix that has u1, u2, and u3 as its rows. That's capital U transpose. So capital U is the transpose of U transpose. And then we multiply U transpose times U and see that we do, in fact, get the identity matrix. So that shows that these three vectors form an orthonormal basis for R3. Now, part B of this question, same three vectors. Now we have the vector negative 6, 2, 1, and we want to compute the coordinate vector V sub B. But remember that now that we know that we have an orthonormal basis, computing these coordinates is very simple. 
all we need to do is take the dot product of v with each of these vectors. So here I've entered my vector v into Wolfram, and I've just computed the three dot products v dot u1, v dot u2, and v dot u3. So those three numbers in that list there are the three coordinates of v in the basis b, so that is the coordinate vector of v. Now Wolfram isn't great at simplifying expressions involving radicals, especially involving fractions and radicals, so we can simplify this using the simplify command. And notice that I'm using the percent sign there. In Wolfram, the percent symbol just means the previous output, so I'm just telling Wolfram simplify the previous output. And now I'm just verifying that these coordinates are correct by multiplying the first coordinate times u1 plus the second coordinate times u2 plus the third coordinate times u3 and verifying that I do get the original vector v. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.